Good morning, party people, and welcome to Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm standing in front of the uh, Gallery of Foreign Art, because why wouldn't I come to Bulgaria and stand in front of some other country's art gallery? Okay, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's a really pretty building that's right next to my hotel. So I'm like, oh, sure, why don't I go stand in front of that while I do the office hours? Uh, yesterday, I did the uh, Present to Succeed conference here in Sofia. I uh, had a great time. As I expected, so this is my first time ever presenting at a conference that's uh, uh, mostly done by people who do presentations, uh, coaching for a living, and agencies that do other people's slides for them. And I, I kind of expected going in that my slides would be the ugliest. In fact, they were. <laughs> And I knew I was in trouble on rehearsal day when the other presenters uh, happened to make a joke about bullet points. And I was like, well, what do you mean? What's wrong with bullet points? And turns out I was the only presenter who had bullet points. I was the only presenter who had like information dense slides. And if you're in the tech industry uh, like I am, you're probably used to seeing very information dense slides. And you're like, what's the alternative? So one of the things that I learned yesterday was uh, that the current trend is to make people feel something, uh, register with them emotionally, uh, so that that way it drives them to take the action that you want. And then at the end of the presentation, you give them a PDF with like 10 bullet points or 20 bullet points with the, the most important things for them to know about that topic. I don't think you're going to see a dramatic shift in my presentations along those lines. Uh, I, I think that making people feel something is kind of a byproduct of what I do. I don't think it's my primary uh, goal as a presenter, uh, but it was really interesting to see how other presenters approach that, that problem. And I, I think that a lot of the presentation industry is uh, is driven around sales and marketing, you know, like getting people to take an emotional response and invest in a company or buy a product. Whereas training classes or, or uh, education is a slightly different market. You, you wouldn't go to a college class and expect the, the, the professor to get you to feel something in order to get you to remember something. So I, I think it was a really worthwhile experience for me. I, I think I'll probably come back, uh, but I don't think you're going to see big changes in the way that I do presentations based on that. I, I think I do clearly have to raise my game in terms of what my slides look like, uh, but I think the next step for me would probably be to, to go attend an educational conference. It would also be kind of uh, interesting to see. So let's go through your top voted questions from PollGab. I'm filming this on my iPhone, so I don't have a separate device to go pull up your questions. I didn't bring an iPad or anything this trip. So the top voted question from my T got cold says, if all of my columns are Enver care, AKA Unicode, is there a performance benefit to always wrapping my strings in N? You put a little N at the beginning of Unicode. Is there a performance difference? Not at all, not that I'm aware of. As long as the data in the table is Unicode, then you'll be fine with, uh, without wrapping the strings in N. I would say it's generally a good practice to make your data types match whatever's in the database, just so that people have that conscious thought of, oh, here's what's inside the database, but I, I don't think it really matters for that particular problem. Next up, Sad But True says, Hey Brent, most of our Azure SQL DBs have their top weight stats related to parallelism and their performance isn't great. We can't modify cost threshold for parallelism in Azure SQL DB. What other techniques can we use to reduce the weight stats associated with parallelism? Hmm. Let's see. Could you maybe tune the queries or tune the indexes so that your queries don't have to go parallel and they can get their work done faster. Isn't it funny? I mean, you're not the first person to, to, to stumble across this problem, but people get so focused on the CX weights that they forget the big obvious. Hey, tune your queries to do less work and then parallelism won't be as much as a problem for you. I know you want a magic button that you can just change cost threshold and max dot, but the reality is, is that rarely makes queries perform better. It just changes the footprint that they have on the server, but users don't high five you for that. 
Next up, Dom says, hi Brent, I noticed something strange on a SQL Express 2012 instance. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop you right there. It's 2024. 2012 hasn't been supported in years. Express edition is free. Go get on the latest. Don't tell me about your, how you're trying to work on your Model T Ford. Go get on a free, they're free. SQL Server Express is free. Go get on the current version. That's gonna be the end of that story. Next up, DBA Junior says, Hi Brent, in my company, users can design any query they want. For example, they can choose multiple columns for the order by or in the where clause. I can't change the queries in the app, but they tell me that the queries are slow and the tables have millions of rows. How can I handle this? This is a really great question. And, and when I'm working with clients on this, I like to tell them that I've got three dials that I can turn. As a database person, I can turn three different dials. One dial is the query design or query quality. You can also think of it as application cache, caching. But the queries themselves, I can tune the queries. I have another dial for index and table design. Can I change the indexes? Can I change the tables? The third dial is hardware. You can throw more hardware at the problem. So I tell companies, all right, which ones of these am I allowed to tune? Can I tune the query dial? Nope. Can I tune the index dial? You say, nope. Okay, so the only dial that I have left is hardware. We're going to spend more. They don't like hearing that. They're like, well, wait a minute, don't you have some other kind of magic button that you can push? No, but I'd love to hear about it. If you find another magic button, I'd certainly love to push it. Clients would pay a whole lot of money to have another magic button they could turn or dial that they could tweak around, but that's it. There you go. Sometimes hearing that consultant approach or hearing uh, just the matter of fact, here are all the options that we have, helps open people's eyes to what their choices are. Next up, DBA and VA says, what causes a query not to use the execution plan that I forced in query store? Isn't that the whole idea of the forced plan? Yeah, there are plenty of situations where SQL Server can't use plan forcing. I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. The place to go, is, the place to start is Erin Stilato's class on query store. She has a class on plural site that you can go watch over there. I don't know of anybody else doing classes on Query Store, uh, so that's the place that I would start. Aaron's all, Aaron and Kendra Little have both had blog posts about why Query Store can't force plans, so those are the places I would start. Aaron Stilato and Kendra Little, and then include your search terms there. Uh, Ruby Sunday says, is it bad, is it is creating a non-clustered index that's on the same columns as the clustered index to avoid blocking considered a best or bad practice. So what you have to think about is, what kind of query would use that index? If it's only on the ID, that probably means where ID equals one, two, three, four, five, or whatever your ID is, you're looking for one exact ID. Well, what else does that query need? Obviously, it isn't just gonna select the ID, it's gonna select other columns. So it sounds like what you're gonna do is you're gonna put in the includes a bunch of columns that don't change so that you can read from those while at the same time avoiding the blocking on the hot columns on the clustered index that change all the time. In theory, does it work? Yes. In a much better scenario, what you do is choose either RCSI or SI, read committed snapshot isolation or snapshot isolation. These are two options that let you uh, let readers and writers coexist in SQL Server. I've got, uh, Kendra Little wrote a big long blog post about it. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash RCSI, brentozar.com slash go slash RCSI. Uh, next up, They Blame Me says, Hi Brent, what's your opinion of this Microsoft recommendation to prevent lock escalation? And he's got a T-SQL query inside of there that has a wait for. I, I don't, a wait for isn't going to solve the problem for blocking there because the wait for just holds locks longer. Think about it, if you try to do something and then you wait, if it fails, you're just holding out the locks for a longer period of time. No one's really going to like that. 
What I think you might be misunderstanding is they do give similar recommendations for Hecaton, aka in memory OLTP. That's different because technically Hecaton doesn't have blocking. They have uh, retriable transactions, but they don't have blocking. So that, that is a little different. What's my opinion of that? I Usually every client that I've ever had on Hecaton uh, has been trying to find a way out. That's not true. I, I've said that for a long time, but that's not true. I've had a couple of satisfied clients on Hecaton for very specific scenarios. Uh, but the vast majority of the time when somebody comes to me on Hecaton, they're trying to get off. Uh, next up, Danish DBA says, my friend needs to create an index on a highly used table on SQL Server Standard Edition. On a copy of the database of the same server, he knows it takes up to four minutes. The goal is to minimize the impact as a service window is not allowed. What's the best approach? You've hit upon something really interesting here. When the company says you're not allowed to go down, that's one of the big triggers for Enterprise Edition. SQL Server Enterprise Edition offers the ability to create indexes online, to do online index rebuilds. So there's a cost to that. And if the company tells me we truly cannot take an outage for things like creating an index, great, here's the price tag for that. And what you usually find is that when companies hear what the price tag is, they say, oh, well, the maybe we could go down for four minutes and then that changes the conversation. It may not in your company, you might be, they might whip out their credit card and go to town, but that helps you with uh, that discussion there. And then finally, just wondering asks, I've been suspicious that something outside of SQL Server is a problem, but I don't know how to prove it. I changed from using the JTD, JTDS JDBC driver to the Microsoft driver, and I saw 40% improvement in run times. How could I find what the Microsoft do, uh, driver is doing differently? So when you get to that level of troubleshooting, when you get to say, I'm actually going to change the driver that my apps use to connect, there are two things that I think about. First off, what are you measuring? Are we down to like millisecond level measurements? And if we're down to millisecond level measurements in between two queries, then sure, you might actually be willing to change the, the, the driver that your application is using. But when you say, how do I find out what the driver is doing differently? You're not actually going to do anything about that. You're not going to rewrite the driver, right? If you need those milliseconds of performance, it's just a matter of choosing which driver you're going to use. And then the second thing that I think about is, are your developers actually willing to change the driver that they're using? If not, stop doing those tests. You're not achieving anything because you and I are not recoding the device drivers, nor are we changing the driver that our application uses. Now, the, but again, it all comes back to, are these millisecond level measurements? If they're not millisecond level me measurements, and you're talking about say 100 milliseconds versus 10 seconds, then sure, here's what you're looking at, is you're bringing back large amounts of data. Is that someone's trying to fire hose an entire table down to the front end, in which case I ask, why are we doing that? I've seen cases where somebody says, well, this one driver only takes a second, as opposed to the other one takes 10 seconds to digest this three gigabyte XML. And I'm like, well, you, you shouldn't be sending, that's not what relational databases are for. You shouldn't be sending multiple gigabytes of data down the wire to some front end application. So let's step back and kind of rehearse the step back through the whole thing. If you're only talking about millisecond level differences, then ask yourself, are you really going to change drivers? If you're not, stop having that conversation. Your performance tuning is done. If you are going to change drivers, just tell your app team, here's what I found. Here's why this, or this driver seems to be faster. Would you, let's go ahead and try this in a load testing environment. If you're talking about second level differences, it's probably about the sheer amount of data you're bringing back rethink about why you're bringing that much data down to the client or whether it should be done in like a document database instead. Sometimes I feel guilty when I, I don't have, like technically that question would seem like, Brent, you dodged the whole question altogether, but I just don't understand why someone would compare the internals of two database drivers when we're, you and I aren't going to do anything about that. 
and it, it is nice to think about being curious. Like uh, there are so many things that I want to be curious about in life. And I embrace that people want to learn more and want to know everything. I'm guilty of that too. There are so many things that I want to learn that aren't necessarily going to change the way I do stuff. Like I, I would love to learn in theory how large language models work. Uh, but then I start to look about the, the number of hours that it would take for me to actually get that answer. And I'm like, nah, I got other things I want to do. So other today, what are we going to do? We're going to go uh, grab some coffee. Supposedly there's a really good coffee shop around here that the organizers were telling us about. Uh, and then uh, doing bar or doing lunch at a bar here that's supposed to be famous locally. Uh, something Rakita, Rakia, something like that. Uh, it's supposed to be famous here locally for service and for, I think, the number of brandies that they have in stock. So that'll be curious. Um, and then just walking around uh, Sofia during the day, I fly back home tomorrow. I think if I come back here next year, I'll, I'll probably spend a lot longer uh, here. There are so many beautiful places in the world that I'd love to see more of. Uh, but next up, I go home, fly back home, and I'm home for about a week, and then go to Mexico, going to uh, Cabo for a few days. Strange as it sounds, it's actually cooler temperature-wise in Mexico than it is in Las Vegas right now. We're getting highs at like 106 to 110. Excuse me. I had this really big heat wave come through in Vegas, so I'm going to go down to Mexico to get away from the heat for a few days. Uh, and then we're back home for most of the summer until we go out for an Alaska cruise in August. So you'll be seeing a lot. I'll do an office hours down in Cabo for sure. Uh, but then you'll be seeing a lot more of me at home during the summer. So thanks for hanging out with me and I will see y'all on the next office hours. Adios.